stories of struggle and survival. A vital part of American history. A hidden history. Here are Melanie Michael and Rod Carter. Hello, I'm Melanie Michael. And I'm Rod Carter. Thanks so much for joining us for this Hidden History Special. Stories of African Americans that made a tremendous impact and sacrifice for our country. We begin with the first true activist of the modern civil rights era right here in Florida, but not many people know their story. Yeah, you know, I heard this story when I was a child. The names are Harry T. and Harriet V. Moore, and a place of honor has been built to show their accomplishments of their lives and the tragic circumstances of their deaths. Before Martin, before Medgar, there were the Moors. Harry T. and Harriet V. Moore. The Moores were married civil rights activists from Mims, Florida, a tiny town along the Space Coast. It's just east of Orlando. On December 25th, 1951, someone placed sticks of dynamite underneath the front porch of their modest shotgun home. That was the bomb that was heard around the world. They told me that people as far as Titusville and Scotchmore came running to see what happened. They thought NASA blew up. Harry T. Moore passed away that day, and H Harriet died nine days later. Harry Moore was the secretary of the NAACP. He routinely registered black voters. He stood up and spoke out against lynchings. They were the first couple that really took it by the horn. They didn't want to sweep it under the rug. It made him and his wife targets. When they came home, the KKK was lurking in the orange groves. They didn't know it. They were waiting. Many believe that blast shined a brighter light on the civil rights movement. It's about 12 acres. William Gary has dedicated the last several years of his life to this, the Harry T. and Harriet Moore Memorial Park and Museum. This was all orange groves out here. And this, a chance to see how the Moors lived. There's a replica of their home, complete with an icebox, wood-burning stove. Uh, the radio that, uh, you know, they had. Touches of 1951. Gary told me not enough people know about the Moors and the sacrifice they made for freedom. The early civil rights movement uh, re uh, received a tremendous boost uh, and the interest in their story has just grown by leaps and bounds over the years. At the Moore Museum, take a brief walk through African American history. You can see photos, info, even their voter registration book from decades ago, signed by Harry and Harriet Moore. And it's a uh, very emotional thing with me. Uh, I grew up in uh, the segregated South uh, in Mississippi, uh, actually in a hotbed of, of civil rights activity. So uh, my ability to get a college education, uh, to be an engineer and work for NASA uh, is a direct result of things that they were fighting for back then. It's been more than 66 years since that bomb exploded here in Brevard County. A bomb blast that everyone says was so loud it could be heard for miles and miles away. And to this day, no one's ever been brought to justice. And though they want that to happen one day, they don't hold out hope. Only the hope that soon, everyone will know of the Moors and their story. Uh, Harry Moore was fighting against uh, lynchings, trying to get legislation passed to uh, outlaw lynching. He was fighting against police brutality, which we still have an issue with today. In 1945, Harry T. Moore formed something called the Florida Progressive Voters League, and it became uh, the executive director of that organization. That organization, by the way, very instrumental in helping register more than 100,000 African-American voters here in the state of Florida. And by the way, he worked with a lot of folks from right here in Tampa Bay throughout his years in that organization. Other artifacts of the Moore's home and their story on display at the Smithsonian National Museum of African-American History and Culture in D.C. Well, he's part of a small group of living veterans who served in three major wars. And although he has traveled the world over, Amy Simpson introduces us to this American hero who calls Central Virginia home. Colonel Porcher Taylor Jr. is a remarkable and decorated war hero, calling Petersburg home for the past 40 years. I have a patriotic spot in my heart for this country of ours. But he says decades in the military didn't come without its challenges. This country, in the beginning, 
was not very nice to me or uh, anybody who looked like me. Taylor's service spanned three wars, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, worn like badges of honor on his hat. He says he only feared death one time when he was put behind a machine gun in Guam that he hadn't been trained on. That's a dangerous weapon. You can kill a whole lot of people. He says he wasn't trained on this heavy artillery because he was a black man. Serving before and during the civil rights movement, Taylor says he worked to empower and promote African Americans in the military. When I first came in as an enlisted man and then later as an officer, the big difference was, I suppose, as an officer, I could do something about it because I was in charge. Taylor left the military after three decades, going on to have a successful career in academia. He was one of the first black men to earn a Ph.D. from University of South Carolina, served as vice president at VSU, founded the Petersburg chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen, even wrote a book. Despite the accolades and legacy apparent to his family and community, he remains humble and kind. I'm 92 and I don't have too much time left. I'm not stupid enough not to believe that. In Petersburg, Amy Simpson. Coming up on Hidden History, the stories of two remarkable women. One is named Nell, and she has given her name to the civil rights mission. And the other is another woman who fought and won a major battle against slavery. Welcome to Shells. I'm John Christen, and I'm inviting you to check out the best of Florida seafood. We only source the freshest seafood. All of our sauces are made from scratch and dishes cooked to order. So join us at Shell's with five locations in the Bay Area and now opening Carrollwood. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love this. Chevy Cruze and Malibu are making quite an impression. Wi-Fi in a car. I like that it has a camera. I can see where I'm backing up. With old style and innovative technology, it's no wonder people are talking about Chevy Cruze and Malibu. I think I'll be trading in my car now. Head into your local Chevy dealer to get $2,500 total cash allowance on this 2018 Chevy Cruze LT. See your Southern Chevy dealers. Welcome to Shells. I'm John Christen, and I'm inviting you to check out the best of Florida seafood. We only source the freshest seafood. All of our sauces are made from scratch and dishes cooked to order. So join us at Shell's with five locations in the Bay Area and now opening Carrollwood. Hidden History is sponsored by Achieva Credit Union. Banking for good. There are many incredible women included in this special, and this next person has dedicated her life to civil rights and making sure that every vote counts. Tonight, John Gray of our Albany, New York station, WTEN, introduces us to Nell Stokes. Nell Stokes didn't read about the civil rights movement. She lived it. I didn't really recognize the extent of the racism until I was six years old. Raised in Montgomery, Alabama, her best friend was a white girl till the first day of school. And I saw her and I ran over to her and said, I, I was going to say, hi, Connie. And she looked at me and said, why are you talking to me, little nigga? Wow. Get out of my face. And it stunned me. That sting stayed. So years later, when a woman in town named Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat in the bus, Nell and her friends hatched a plan. Well, we got together our pennies and bought some eggs and threw them at the buses. <laughs> that was the first thing I did. It felt good. The next thing, register to vote. All you needed was a few bucks to take a test. I got my $5 together, and I was so excited. I was going to go. I thought I was going to just take the, give them the $5 and be able to vote. Her answers were right, but her skin color wrong. He said, you failed, just get out of here, gal. Get out she did, coming to McCarty Avenue in Albany in the fall of 63, her first order of business. I voted uh, November um, 1963, and I voted every time since. In the five decades since, Nell's volunteered with dozens of causes, including the League of Women Voters, helping others vote. It's not an auto, but awards that fill her garage. The little girl from Alabama has certainly lived a life. Her advice to young women of today? I'll focus on the positive things in life. Be a part of the solution. Most of all, love yourself. You know, you can't do anything for anyone else when you don't love yourself and who you are. In Albany, I'm John Gray.
Great advice indeed. Well, when Indiana became a state in 1816, a ban on slavery was written into the Constitution. And as Mike Tank tells us, the law became because of a controversial court case and the strength of one woman aptly named Polly Strong. We have a state based constitution and we have a federal law. The legal studies class at Vincennes University prepares students for future careers as paralegals. Part of their education includes a look back in time. Has anyone ever heard of Polly B. LaSalle? And at all the history classes I had, I never, this is never brought up. Student Carrie L. Shaw is not alone. Most Hoosiers have never heard of Polly Strong or the role she played in the state's history. Polly was a second generation slave. Her mother had been a slave. And Professor Vanessa Purdom shares Polly's story and how abolitionist lawyers helped her fight for her freedom from Vincennes innkeeper Hyacinth LaSalle. Many people feel that Indiana is ultra conservative, but here we have an example of remarkable people that were very courageous in making sure that the fundamental rights of all citizens were available. The Vincennes Library now holds many of the original court papers from the court case Polly versus LaSalle. The documents reveal the Knox County Circuit Court first ruled in favor of the innkeeper. The case was then appealed to the state's highest court. The state Supreme Court ruled that the state constitution is quite clear, uh, no slavery or involuntary servitude, therefore Polly is free, and by extension that meant that all of the slaves uh, can no longer be held. Historian Richard Day says little is known of what happened to Polly Strong. Records show she was baptized at St. Francis Xavier Church around the time her case was filed. The Indiana Historical Bureau reports just one mention of her in a state newspaper after the court decision. We may not know how her life progressed, but we do know her legacy lives on. It's an ongoing struggle, and we can hark back to these people like Polly Strong that were soldiers in the battle for freedom that uh, still goes on today. And that was Mike Tank reporting. Unfortunately, the Polly Strong case did not end racism or discrimination against blacks in Indiana, but it did establish early on that freedom for all would be a fundamental right. Coming up next, he was a great friend to a great president and also a man of color. His story is next on Hidden History. I just picked up the cake for the baby shower. Yay! You know she's having a boy, right? Oh boy. Buick now has an SUV for that. Introducing the Buick Encore. I knew I could trust you guys with the cake. No problem. <laughs> That was close. <sighs> One of three luxury SUVs from the new Buick. Current lessees, switch to Buick and get this low mileage lease on this Encore for around $159 per month. Or current non-GM owners, get $4,000 purchase allowance on Encore Preferred. Hidden history is punctured by Achieva Credit Union. Banking for good. Thanks so much for staying with us. Now, before he was America's greatest president, Abraham Lincoln was a rather soft-spoken attorney who walked with his friends down a dusty road in Springfield. And one of those friends was a black man from Haiti and was one of Lincoln's clients mm -hmm. and also his barber. As Mark Maxwell tells us, the two even kept in touch after Lincoln left for the White House. In the early part of the 1900s, um, Someone said that only two people knew Lincoln best, William Herndon, his law partner, and uh, William Florville, his barber. They met in New Salem in the 1830s and formed an unlikely bond, a black immigrant from Haiti and a lanky lawyer from Kentucky. Florville moved around, Lincoln moved around, but they always knew one another by face, by name, by business, by friendship. Both embarking on a new life, both setting up shop in Springfield probably saw him every week either on the street here or going into Florville's barbershop which was about a half a block away from the Lincoln Herndon law office. They swapped jokes, traded books and both got married by the same reverend. Lincoln's wife grew up owning slaves. Florville's wife was one. Phoebe uh, Roundtree Florville, um, she had once been enslaved, his wife, so 
for, and I'm not sure how she uh, escaped from that en enslavement, but she could have been taken or re-enslaved if she had been a runaway, runaway slave. National politics, a civil war, even 800 miles couldn't separate two old friends. William Florville is one of the few people in Springfield who wrote Lincoln a letter while he was president just to say hi as an old friend. One month after Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, Florville wrote the president, the shackles have fallen and bondmen have become free men. But the struggles of the Florville family were far from over. It is truly a tragedy. His grandson, George Richardson, was the man that Maybell Hellum, the um, woman that said she was a, a raped and attacked by an African-American man, um, he was the, uh, William Florville's grandson. He, he did tell stories, you know, about the riots. Norm Willis grew up hearing his grandfather's stories about the 1908 race riots that led to the start of the NAACP. It was probably really scary times, and he uh, survived it thanks to some friends of his, and just amazing to, to hear that something like that happen right here in Springfield. Norm's mom, Irene, still lives in the same house in Springfield, a direct descendant of William Florville. We were the only colored family besides an old couple that lived across the street. She recalls what life was like for a young married couple in the 1950s. Well, it wasn't too very good until we finally got to talking to people and I'm telling them where I lived and you, li you mean you live there? But then, and they said, well, you don't look like you should live there. Her great grandchildren still live in Springfield, a city just as much theirs as it was President Lincoln's. I've had a wonderful life and, uh, and, I, and I learned how to treat people. And that was Mark Maxwell reporting. Abraham Lincoln once said, quote, I'm a success today because I had a friend who believed in me and I didn't have the heart to let him down. Maybe he was thinking of his friend, William Florville. The family you are about to meet from Champaign, Illinois, is as loyal as they come. Anthony Antoine tells us tonight at least one member of the family has served in every single war since the American Revolution. When valuable artifacts and family stories are being passed from one generation to the next, that was why they ended up rioting. history can sometimes get lost in the shuffle. And he became part of, like you said, the, the, um, yeah. the three seven. But, but for Barbara Suggs Mason and Angela Rivers, they're making it a point to keep their grandfather's legacy intact. As a little girl, my mother had a book, and it was called um, History of a Race. She would show me where. Cecil Nelson's name was in that book for his service in World War I. Cecil Nelson was part of the 8th Regiment of the Illinois National Guard, and he was trained at Camp Logan in Texas. That's where he reunited with his friend, William Frank Ernest, from Homer, Illinois. Now, although they would be fighting for the United States, they wouldn't be fighting with other American soldiers overseas. The American military was a segregated military at that time. These African-American soldiers were very accepted by the French. Along with their French allies, they went to war. And William Frank Ernest became the first African-American from Champaign County to die in World War I. After the battle, um, Grandpa and his friends um, and the cover of darkness went out into no man's land and found um, uh, Frank Ernest's body and buried him. Nelson pushed on. He ended up um, capturing uh, German soldiers and destroying one of their camps. Earning the Croix de Guerre for his heroic actions in battle. Nelson returned home and married Carrie Ernest, the niece of his dear friend William. Estelle Merrifield is one of their six kids. He would make us get mine, say the pledge of allegiance, stand as a pledge. <laughs> and we thought he, we were his soldiers. And he led by example. Nelson is one of the founding fathers of the Douglas Center. He started the Boy Scout Troop 11. And with the help of other veterans in town, he created the William Frank Ernest American Legion Post 559. Not to mention, Nelson Court bears his name. He really gave his family a sense of uh, pride. And that pride came from the earnest side of the family as well. When we would go to see football games at the U of I, 
um, my parents would walk us up to the colonnade to the column where William Frank Ernest's name was. As a country, the United States doesn't seem to understand the role that African Americans have played here outside of slavery. Fighting in World War I was a way for black men to prove their worth in the search for equality. They didn't get it when they came home, but at least for this family, the circumstances of a divided country didn't force them to bow their heads. Instead, it created an unwavering sense of purpose that will be passed down for generations. And I think this is important that people know, you know, that there's, you know, the African Americans, they're not just an add-on to this country, that they are a, a direct part of this country. What a great story. Special family. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. All right, stay with us. We'll be right back. Okay, it's Ford Truck Month, and here's how it works. You take F-150, Motor Trend's Truck of the Year, work in best-in-class towing and payload, sweeten up the offer, and boom. Look who just saved a stack of cash. Step on its board. Drive home America's best-selling truck 41 years straight. Ford Truck Month this year. It's buy now time, people. Just announced, get a 2018 F-150 with over $10,400 in total savings, plus an additional thousand on top of your trade-in. At Mutual of Omaha, we listen only to our customers, not to Wall Street, not to outside shareholders. We listen to you. For over 100 years, it's how we've built honest, compassionate, and lasting relationships. And so, that's how we begin, by listening. To see how we can recommend the insurance that makes sense for you, call 800-88-LISTEN or find an agent at mutualofomaha.com. Breaking news. Reports of two bank trucks hit in the last 24 hours. More on this story as it develops. They didn't crash the Camry. Why didn't we crash the Camry? I tried. The car just stopped by itself. Fine, we'll do it with special effects. Oh, so that you'll do with special effects? Lisa new reinvented 2018 Toyota Camry LE for $1.99 a month for 36 months. Toyota, let's go places. Butch Azure had expected to spend his retirement gasping for breath and suffering from fatigue. But after being misdiagnosed by several doctors and on the verge of giving up, he was correctly diagnosed with persistent arrhythmia. A cardiac catheter ablation was performed at Baycare's St. Joseph's Hospital, and his heart began working the way it should, which enabled Butch to put his heart and soul into not working. Hidden History is punctured by Achieva Credit Union. Banking for good. Again, thanks for staying with us. Segregation wasn't just happening here in the South. When African Americans traveled up north before the Civil Rights Movement, they couldn't go everywhere they pleased. Yeah, that's when a little-known guide was actually published. And as Elsa Streeter tells us tonight, the Green Book, that's what it's called, kept them safe and saved them from humiliation. They take one look at you and don't like what they see. I'm sorry, we just rented the last room. Dr. Gretchen Soren wrote her dissertation at UAlbany on the Negro Motorist Green Book, a book filled with guest homes, gas stations, beauty parlors, and barber shops where African Americans were welcome, including many right here in the Capital Region. This home on Tenbrook Place in Albany was in the book for years, once known as Mrs. McWilliams' Tourist Home. It was one of many guest homes run by African American women. And if she was full up for the night, well, just a few blocks away was Mrs. Madison's guest home on Orange Street. And in Saratoga, the Gideon Putnam Hotel was in the Green Book way back in 1949. Being welcomed wherever you went was key. In the South, it's interesting because there, there are signs, right? There are Jim Crow signs that say colored only um, or white only. In the North, you don't have any of those signs. You didn't want to have to go up to a hotel or a motel and have them say, oh, I'm sorry, we just rented the last room, or I'm sorry, we don't accept colored people here. And so Victor Green published the first Green Book in New York City in 1936, filled with places for African Americans to sleep, eat, and gas up. Uh, many gas stations wouldn't allow African Americans to use their restrooms. So you could buy gas, 
but they wouldn't let you use the restrooms. One gas station was the exception, Esso. Esso made it a corporate policy to welcome African Americans, and soon they were advertising in the Green Book. This old gas station on Lark Street in Albany was the only gas station in the Green Book in the Capital Region for years. Imagine needing to gas up and hoping that you could get to this gas station in time. And I think that's the reason for a guide, a guide like this. It was, um, it, it helps you to be safe, but it also helped you to, to not feel humiliation when you went on the road. Reporting in Albany, I'm Elisa Streeter. Well, the Green Book did stop publication in 1966, just two years after the Civil Rights Act was passed. We are very glad you could join us for this Hidden History Special. Some incredible history and some amazing individuals. Thank you so much, and have a great night.